participation and student persistent rates, and then form university policy. The resulting technology proved so valuable to administrators that the university spun it off into a startup company called Helio Campus that provides both a BI platform and data analysis and services. Congratulations, University of Maryland, University College. <laughs> Next in the category of education futurists, Marshall University. Marshall University history students have the opportunity to contribute to the digital commons through Clio, a free educational website and mobile application that guides users to thousands of historical and cultural sites throughout the United States. The content in Clio is curated by the, the crowd. Anyone can create an entry, students as well as the general public, and highlight historic site with geolinked images, video, and text. Each entry offers turn-by-turn -turn directions, as well as links to relevant books, articles, videos, primary sources, and credible websites. Project lead David Travage is unable to attend today. Congratulations, Marshall University. And finally, in the category of education futurists, the University of Oklahoma. University of Oklahoma Libraries created a mobile app designed to put an end to the intimidation factor that people feel when visiting the library for the first time. The OU Libraries NAV app combines indoor Bluetooth beacons and outdoor GPS to guide users through large indoor environments while providing location-based info and relevant push notifications about events, exhibit details, tutorials, and more. The app not only enriches the visit experience, it also helps administrators track usage of library resources. Congratulations, University of Oklahoma. Be sure to check out coverage of these terrific projects in our July issue and on our website. You also have the opportunity to meet many of the innovators in the poster session this afternoon in the exhibit hall. Congratulations again to all our innovators. Thank you, Rainer, and congratulations to all of our award winners. I'm um, going to introduce Stephen as he comes up and plugs himself in. Um, we, were, we were very fortunate to have Stephen down with us this morning. Um, I'm going to follow up on the theme of our award winners for the year to the top of the theme of innovation itself. Uh, many of you know Stephen, he is a recognized international expert in online learning technology and community. He is a program leader for learning and performance support systems for the National Research Council of Canada, where his work focuses on personal learning environments. He is known as the originator of the massive open online course, and he is recognized as a leading voice in the open education movement. He has published hundreds of articles online and in print. And much like today, he has presented his work on five continents. That's perfect timing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our very special keynote speaker, Mr. Stephen Gatton. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephen Downs, as you were just told. I work at the National Research Council of Canada, which means I live in Canada, which means I'm not from around here, uh, but I'm sure we'll get along just fine. How are we doing up there? Okay, good. Just checking the uh, slides in that. Um, you can see at the, the uh, bottom of the title slide the URL for this presentation. If you go to that URL, you will be able to uh, download the slides and therefore look at the little tiny references at the bottom, uh, which you can't even read from here, but uh, you can follow those up at your leisure. I'm really sorry about the title of this talk. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. Really, it's a talk about change and about innovation and about transformation. Uh, a little bit of my uh, credentials in that area. Uh, 
uh, back in 1995, give or take, I built a learning management system for a Cinnabon Community College. That makes me a technologist. I've been writing software ever since. Way too much software, none of it really that good, but that's okay. Um, and I was challenged, challenged, they demanded at the time that I explain what I was doing with the college's money, namely my salary. So I spent two weeks in the July of 1998 writing a paper called The Future of Online Learning. And uh, that kind of, well, kind of gave me a bit of a name in the field as a futurist. Uh, I'm happy to say that that paper is bang on. I even got the name of the iPad right. Uh, and, and a lot of the innovations that people are talking about even today. For an example, yesterday we were talk, told about how uh, traditional in-class learning was converging with online learning to become all, all one thing. Uh, and that's being presented as new. I wrote about that in 1998. So I'm a bit of a track record. I'm also one of those Canadians that was referenced but not named in yesterday's keynote. One of those Canadians who, along with George Siemens, and in fact, George and I worked together on this, created the first massive open online course. That was in 2008. The name of the course was called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. I wrote the software uh, that we used in order to support the course. It, of course, came up three years before Coursera, Udacity, and all the rest of it made the concept of the MOOC famous. So I think I have some credentials in the area. I haven't talked about innovation specifically and transformation specifically before, but I've done a few talks. So I think I can probably work my way around this. So let's begin with a few concepts. Um, and we're going to go through, uh, as I say, change, innovation, transformation, and all the rest. Let me begin with the future. And I want to tell you that the future, on the one hand, is kind of messed up. But on the other hand, it is not really the big mystery that everybody thinks it is. It all, all kind of smooshes together. This is a picture of, well, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I thought it was a fish for many years. Now I'm thinking that it's kind of like an upside down duck or bird or something. Uh, or maybe it's a turtle. I don't know. Um, anyhow, it was painted on a cave wall in Kakadu uh, in northern Australia, in the Northern Territory. Um, and I take this as kind of my touch point for talking about change, talking about the future talking about it, the innovation why why would i take this as my touch point when it's you know it was created i don't know 2000 3000 4000 years in the past there is an actual dating of it but i don't recall what it is why would i take this as my touch point well it shows us how the past and the future all get smooshed together the person who put this on a cave wall in australia wasn't thinking of the past, except maybe their own past experience. And they weren't just drawing fish or turtles or whatever for fun. I've looked at this, and I've read books about this, and my best guess is that this is an instruction manual telling people what they will find if they open up a fish or turtle. And I can imagine an Aborigine saying to shorter Aborigines, eat this part, don't eat that part. That's a theory, it's a guess, but it's a pretty good guess. And it's based on the signs or the evidence that I've been given of this painting. So how could they do this 4,000 years ago? How could they tell what part of the fish or turtle to eat or not eat? Well, they predicted the future. You know, catch another fish like this one, it's going to look like this. How do they knew? They say nobody can predict the future. Ridiculous assertion. Totally ridiculous assertion. Let's make some predictions together. 
Oops, it's not going to click. Come on, click. These are lupin growing in Brunswick. I predict that these flowers will grow, and I can give you precise locations along the sides of highways. Uh, these flowers will grow next spring in New Brunswick, guaranteed. Not a surprise, they're perennials. They're going to grow there. This is a forest. It's, in, it's a nice forest. It's in uh, a park in Estonia. I predict that this summer and next summer, there will be leaves on those trees. And even more precisely, I predict that this winter, it'll look like this again with all the leaves gone. That's pretty precise, right? I can point to that specific tree, and I can even point to the likely location of some of the leaves that will appear next year. Astrology should be this good. I predict that at Durango Steakhouse, which as I recall is in Texas, but I, I'm not positive about that, there, there will be people sitting at those chairs and those tables sometime over this weekend. Pretty much likely to be correct of their whole business and that prediction being true. This is a marketplace in Riga, Latvia. I predict that this weekend, that market place full. So, any of you think I'm wrong in my predicting? Am I a soothsayer? Uh, am I magic? No. We predict all the time. We do it happily and easily. All of you people are in this room, evidence that you predicted that there would be something worth watching up here. Now, Certainly there's something that can be watched up here, whether it's worth watching. Eh, we'll work that out over the next 53 minutes and 51 seconds. Think about this. Let's think about this. What's going on? Here's what that Aboriginal drawing tells me. We predict by reading the signs. I mean that quite literally, and this will be the theme of the whole talk, and we're going to come back to that around at the end of it, and I'm going to talk about the actual mechanisms of reading the signs and give you a takeaway to take away. As I say, it's not magic, but it's not mechanical either, right? It's not, uh, you know, hypothesis, deduction, all of that, well, they play a role, but Overall, let me just whack the microphone for effect here. Overall, prediction is an instance of recognition. It's part of a wider set of capacities that. Now, I've got a whole story to tell about the epistemology of recognition, but this isn't that talk. But I do want to tell you that there is a whole story to be told about that. Okay. Let me be a little more precise. The future and the past are, as they say, epistemologically equivalent. We don't know any more about the past than we do about the future. Our mechanisms for knowing about the past are the same as our mechanisms for knowing about the future. And not just past and future, they also inform our knowledge of possibility and necessity. They also inform our knowledge of probability and chance. We're using the same kind of thing. So think of it this way. You are here right now. Well, actually, you're over there. But from your perspective, you are here, right? And then out there somewhere is the past, is the future is necessity is probability is the next room is the basement etc all of these are at as they say an epistemological different or sorry an epistemological distance from you what that means is you do not have direct perceptual awareness of them but you do have 
indirect perceptual awareness of them, and we use the same mechanisms, the same mental mechanisms, to think of the future as we think of the past, or probability, necessity, etc. This is really useful because we're pretty good at thinking about the past. Some of us live there, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, so we get how we know about the past. How do you, how do you, and again, there isn't some special process, you don't go through some special mechanisms to understand the past, you just recollect it. You just do it, it's automatic. Children can do it, cats can do it, it's nothing special. It's not some deep, uh, deep, uh, I'm looking for a word, they're not finding it, deep technical skill. So far so good? Do you buy that? Yeah, it's actually pretty reasonable. People don't actually say it that way, but when you think about it, all right. Now let's talk about change. Because change is what makes all of this knowledge about the past and the future, etc., a little bit fuzzy. If everything changed the same, we would have a perfect awareness of the past and the future, wouldn't we? Because it'd be just like the present. So change is the wild card. Change is the thing that, if you will, changes. All right. Change is something that we recognize. It depends on your point of view. Now, I wanted to have a picture here, and I couldn't think of a good way to make it work with the slideshow, so I didn't put the picture in. But I want you to think of, here's your picture, think of it like it's an oceanside scene, right? And maybe there's a stretch of beach. And then, of course, you know, there's the ocean stretching out into the horizon, and there's a nice clear blue sky, and you're in one of these places, it's one of these paradise places, so they don't get storms or big rain clouds like that. And you, you go there, and your villa looks out onto the scene, and it looks like that every day, every single day. And when, when you talk to people, why do you go to this vacation spot? You say, oh, nothing changes. I know it's always going to be like this. I know I'm going to have clear blue sky, nice warm ocean, etc. Makes perfect sense. At the same time, with the same picture, there is literally, well, not quite literally, because I included the beach, but almost literally nothing the same. The water has completely replaced itself, and it's actually new water. The waves have completely new waves. The air has been completely replaced. We have new air, etc. It is a brand new day. Everything changes. So from the very same perspective, you could say nothing has changed or everything has changed. Change is a perceptual thing. Change is a recognition thing. And so I don't have the reference with me, but there was actually some work done in um, quantum physics that talks about time as being the same as space. It's static, right? And you think, well, how can that be? We see the progression of time. There it is, telling me I have 47 minutes and 18 seconds. Uh, but, you know, time could be, from the perspective of a human, the same as space that... You know, if we're in a railway train, we look out the window, we see stuff going by. It's like the landscape is moving. Well, from the perspective of a human, we look at time, it goes by. It's like time is moving, but time is just another dimension like space. So change depends on recognition. Change depends on perception. What counts as change is, depends on how you see the world. What counts as change often depends on what you're looking for. It's not an objective reality. People often talk, you know, change is inevitable. That's the most ridiculous statement in the world. Well, everything that exists is inevitable, otherwise it wouldn't exist, right? But beyond that, we've been given no more precision. You know, change is inevitable. Well, maybe it isn't. You know, what you're looking for, moreover, 
depends on what you currently value. What counts as change is based on what matters to you. Now, just to mess you up a little more, I hope I'm messing up your epistemological foundations here, because that's my job. <laughs> my, my real academic background is in philosophy, can you tell? I know, you weren't expecting this, but I, I need to set this groundwork uh, in order to make some of the points I want to make later. Change, we, we think about change as being you know, from the past to the future. Uh, linear, etc. But actually, all kinds of changes work through all kinds of dimensions. That's why I say necessity, probability, past, future, chance, etc. These are all epistemologically similar, and change works through them all. You know, like I walk to, I can walk, a past state to a possibility state. Doesn't mean I'm actually walking. But that's an indication, that's a change of competency. From I can state of possibility to, to I'm going to walk, which is a state of proximate future, that's a change of affordance. Uh, from I should walk to I will walk, right? So from obligation to future, change of obligation, even tradition is kind of a change. Uh, I was walking, therefore I am walking, that's tradition. And if you know, it's from a past state to a present state, there are all kinds of ways of talk, and I'm, that's just a quick survey. I could draw an arrow from any of those boxes to any of those boxes that to change. And a lot of those changes, although interestingly not all of them, have labels, and they're tight. They're uh, we talk about every day: affordances, competencies, actions, etc., obligations, so on. Okay, change isn't static. Change isn't the sort of thing you always expect it's going to be. There are different patterns of changes. I wrote a paper of change, not surprisingly. There are a few, it's not an exhaustive list, but it'll do to give us a sense of what this classic linear change, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're driving along the road at a steady 60 miles an hour. So yeah, put it in miles just for you guys. <laughs> uh, you can have acceleration or deceleration. Right? You can speed up or slow down, or you can go with a set patterns of change. Um, you can have acceleration. You put your foot on the pedal, and you keep going, and you're, you're changing, and because you're in a magical rocket ship, you never stop accelerating, and you get ex exponential change. That's it describes a lot of the phenomena on the internet, Moore's Law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or you can have what I've misleadingly called parabolic change. That's, of course, not literally a parabola, as my mathematician friend pointed out to me. And I said to him, no, no, that's, that's a draw in PowerPoint. Um, but the idea, you know, is what goes up must come down, right? I uh, shoot a firework into the sky, it comes down, etc. Or it might be somebody's career, it might be a narrative arc, whatever. You know, Julius Caesar. <laughs> um, everybody's favorite kind of change, especially if you're a climate change skeptic, cyclical change, right? Um, cyclical change, so it's literally, it's circles, right? But if you map out a circle over time, you get a sine wave or a cosine wave, et cetera. Uh, it's repeated change. There's a frequency of change. There's a period of that change, et cetera. It's kind of a way of being the same. Then you have the dialectic, which is cycles through time with acceleration. So this is the, the more accurate picture of climate change, right? It's going up, but it goes up by going up and down and up and down and up and down, et cetera. And I could go on, there's a whole list of these things. So one of the things about change is you look, you see change, but you don't just see change. The thing that, one of the things that we do is we assume, oh yeah, it's just part of the cycle, you know? 
Um, uh, politics naturally swings from the left to the right, from the left to the right. And we, we forget that any one of these kind of changes could apply. We talk about Moore's law as though it's inevitable, but it's not inevitable. What causes change? Now, as a proper epistemologist, I know that cause is a construct that we impose on reality, but we'll leave that part of it aside and look at the different kinds of things that create change. And just off the cuff, I've broken them into two major categories. One category, the one we hear about all the time, especially in uh, futurist projections or, or economics papers, are drivers of change. Drivers of change, drivers of change are the things that push. There are things like costs, events, crises, interventions, inventions, growth. You know, we hear all the time, technology is a driver of change, right? New technology drives new change. One of the interesting things about drivers of change, and I've kind of tried to represent it in this doc, in this diagram, is it doesn't actually push you in any particular direction. A driver pushes out from the center, if you will. It's, it's a, a creator of chaos, if anything else. Um, yeah, sure, there was a crisis. Uh, the city was flooded, um, where I used to live, Grand Prairie, city's flooded. There's no particular result that follows from that. People flee in all directions, people respond in all different ways. There's change is created, but the result isn't created. The other kind of change, if you will, is what may be called attractors. And I'm using these terms loosely. I'm using the term cause loosely, so you have to be forgiving uh, with me. The attractors are the things that, if you will, pull change. I've put a few attractors in here, values, goals, desires, needs, right? I wake up in the morning, I'm hungry. I'm going to change my state from not having food in my stomach to having food in my stomach. That change is created by my need for food. But the type of change is characterized as well by the attractor. Right? I'm not going to respond to my hunger by getting into a truck and driving to Santa Fe. That would make no sense. I might do that in response to a flood, but I won't do that in response to hunger. Both types of change have counter change. I've just put them in there for completeness. They don't form any particular role in the talk. But of course, for drivers, there's resistance. For attractors, there's inertia. I wake up in the morning, I'm hungry, I need food, but I don't really want to get up yet because it's too early. Inertia characterizes my life. So thinking, now that's, that's the framework, okay? Now, thinking about change in education, especially a lot of the change that gets talked about in our field of educational technology, the bulk of the change that we see is the result of drivers. You look at the changes in writing and publishing, in print technology, changes in public education as a result of social forces pushing us toward, you know, school choice, charter schools, etc. Changes in networks as a result of educational technology. And these forces, these drivers, have typically come from outside education. There isn't, at least to my observation, anything particularly inside education that's forcing us to change, right? It's the forces outside education, affordability, access, uh, the things that get discussed, quality even. Quality, you know, we, we talk about it as it being an inherent property of the ed educational system, but when it's a driver for change, it's because forces outside the system are causing us to need to become accountable or be able to report on progress or be able to produce graduates to meet a particular corporate need or whatever. They're drivers. Trust. 
we keep hearing everyone wants to disrupt education. And every one of these changes, and I've been, like I said, I've been around for 20 years. Actually, I've been around for longer than that. I've been in the field for 20 years or so. And over and over, all of these changes are going to disrupt education. Learning objects, we're going to disrupt education. Learning management systems, we're going to disrupt education. Um, virtual world, second life, was going to disrupt education. Television was going to disrupt education, etc. And in fact, every time somebody says X, like MOOCs say, uh, are going to disrupt education, somebody comes along and says, well, look at all these other changes that did not disrupt education. We see a line here, kind of a steady state, and we assume it's always going to continue that way. But all of these things are forces from outside education. I put a little bit cynically here. Everybody wants to disrupt education actually means we want to keep it the same, but with more benefits for me. That's pretty cynical, and but I could cash that out. And a lot of a lot of the disruptions, and I'll talk about this in a bit, are really very conservative. We're gonna do exactly the same thing that we were, but I get a bigger piece of it. So let's ask, let's put the question, you know, we just did a bunch of rewards for innovations here. Let's ask, what are we actually looking for in, in education? Are we looking for change? Do we need, want, desire, et cetera, the system to change? Or do we want innovation? We ask the question, is what's happening to education, is that change? Or is that innovation? And you know, I'm doing this slide and I'm thinking something that gets done to you. Innovation is something that you do to other people. Again, I think they're two sides of the same coin. So let's think about this. Let's cash this out a little bit. And let's talk about innovation, the concept properly. And that ties us all in with the innovation awards and all of that, which is the purpose of this talk. So, I work in a government research lab, and, and we've had a very business-oriented government over the last decade. They're gone, but their legacy remains. And one of the things that was hammered into us as government researchers over and over and over is that we are working to an innovation agenda, and innovation is not just having of ideas. And you see that represented, stated, a lot in the literature. I've cited a couple of sources here, including Wikipedia, because I felt like it. Uh, but you read it over and over. Peter Drucker, uh, Innovation CC, Tom Jenkins in Canada, so on and so forth. Right. And I've, I've kind of distilled it down to the slogan, innovation equals idea plus execution plus benefit. Those aren't literal pluses in a mathematical sense. Just think of them as conjunctions, right? This and this and this. Okay, so what does that mean? How is that useful? Well, the idea is the stuff we typically associate and typically actually award uh, in, in innovation, right? It might be a new kind of product or service. It might be a new kind of process a chain, you know, the, the production line, for example, is an innovation. It might be an organizational innovation, Six Sigma or whatever, uh, you know, management, um, which really means one person decides everything, leave that aside. Um, it might mean market innovation, right? Reaching into new markets. Uh, you know, uh, exporting your product to China and India, selling uh, education to developing nations, or it might be reaching to new markets, right? Instead of uh, young adults, 18 to 25 from relatively affluent families, we see our market as a much wider population, including adults, poor people, and, and others, things like that. Or it might be an input innovation where we're actually using new raw material uh, you know, Creative Commons is kind of an input innovation. Instead of getting 
content produced by embedded by publishers, we're getting content produced by uh, communities. Okay, but the idea, these ideas, just the gloss, they're the thing that we reward, but they're not the innovation itself. What makes the innovation the innovation is the benefit. There are two types of benefits. The first one is what we can call sustaining. And they're the typical benefits that we talk about. We hear about them, you know, again, even at this conference, I, I heard all of these terms referred to at least once and some of them several times, right? The benefit, a better quality of experience, uh, lower cost, and many people talk about online learning in that sense, increased efficiency, solutions to problems, etc. These are benefits they can probably be cashed out in terms, you know, financial terms, but they're not exclusively in financial terms. On the other hand, we have our friend uh, uh, Clayton Christensen with disruptive innovations, and a disruptive innovation is characterized by a change in benefit. So we have the incumbents existing universities say, who are targeting higher end customers, loading more and more features onto whatever the offering is for higher end cultures. If we think of the educational system, right? First we had some guy in a room talking about physics and then we had a residence and then we had you know, residence life committees and then we had a football team and then we had a garden and all of that, all to teach physics, right? Um, and so disruptors come along with, as they say, product and price advantage. And the idea is to distill what the essential element is of the product or service, offer that at a lower price to a wider audience, and now you're eating the market from the outside. You're collecting the 80% of the market who doesn't need the high-end service. In, in education, it's like all you're doing now is doing physics lectures forget the residents, forget the football team, et cetera. And that ultimately disrupts your business model. And that's the story that we are being told about education. I think it's a false story for some important reasons, but that's the story that we are being told. And it's not just the product, of course, it can be any one of these different types of innovative ideas. So, but let me kind of shift the thinking a little bit. Let's think of innovation not as a driver. You know, from the perspective of a person to whom the innovation is being done, yeah, it's a driver, right? It's change, it's being imposed on me. But from the perspective of the innovator, it's more like an attractor, right? The drivers are pushing out, they're creating chaos and all of that, but the innovators, are actually drawing people in to some particular view or perspective of what the product must be. And if we look at disruptive innovation, we see this very clearly. Let's go back to the physics lecture, right? So the innovator, the disruptive innovator says, oh yeah, physics lecture, that's the core of education. That's the low cost thing that we're gonna provide. We're all gonna be like Khan Academy or whatever. And we're gonna provide physics lectures online with black screens and colored, never mind. And that'll be the thing that disrupts education. We're attracting innovation into that direction. We're defining what the goal or benefit is, which is a part of the existing goal or benefit. And that's our innovation. Well, is that really the picture that A, we want, and B, we are getting in education? I mean, it sounds like a reasonable story, right? It sounds like you know, we're gonna get to the basics of education, undercut people on price and product. But I have a few questions. Is education properly so called your industry actually, quote unquote, ripe for disruption in this way? I think there's a lot of question about whether that's true. Uh, look at what you offer. Is the core of what you offer actually the physics lecture? Is that the thing that 
you deliver and you know and other people poor people if they get that they're basically getting what you provide i don't know you know i think that changes in technology that have focused on this kind of picture of learning have not in fact changed learning and again we go through the list tv portable classrooms learning management systems clickers second life all focused on the the physics lecture as i'm just using physics lecture as a mcguffin but you know the physics lecture as the core of what we offer but ultimately nothing changes they're innovations sure they're innovations um, they're pushed by innovators. These innovators are rewarded for coming up with them. Look at, look at, you know, I'm sure Daphne Kohler has a, an awards wall, um, right? But nothing changed. How can that be? Is education a candidate for disruption? Well, look at the MOOC, right? Look at the MOOC. Look at what. You know, Coursera and edX and all of that have ended up producing. It's, it's very different from what George and I developed, obviously. The focus is on the lecture. Of the fo it, again, yesterday's keynote, right? You know, uh, um, you know my, my good friend, not Peter Thiel, but whomever, uh, you know, cre created this course, said, I'm going to put this course online. Have you seen Khan Academy? Is though Khan Academy invented short YouTube videos that describe stuff. Um, and in the end, the model for Udacity, the model for Coursera is to produce online courses with limited attendance, uh, with enrollment, you know, with, with you know, a price, a tuition fee, uh, with uh, the requirement that you have to be admitted to the university. Our new innovation looks exactly like the old one. No change, no substantive change. What counts as innovation? What counts as innovation really is, again, one of these things that depends on perspective or point of view. I don't think of, as, as we call them, X moves as an innovation. I don't think of televised lectures as an innovation, et cetera, if it didn't change anything. Is there a demand for these things? Is there a business case for these things? Is there a benefit for these things? All of these things matter. But let's look at the concept of benefit. And let's, you know, I've just listed three things here, right? Demand, business case and benefit. These are, in our descriptions of innovation, held static, as though they don't change. It's all about the content, it's all about the learning, it's all about the outcomes, it's all about the physics lecture. But what happens when these change? What happens when the purpose of going to a university, say, isn't to get the physics lecture? That's when we get transformation. That's a butterfly in Spain. All right. We need to think about our actual model of what's going on when we do research, development, innovation, and all of that. And people have this picture of science where we have this outcome that we have in mind, and we're going to introduce some change into the ecosystem and then we're going to run a controlled experiment where we'll have an outcome that if we have our intervention should produce the outcome and in the control with no intervention should not produce the outcome. Very typical picture, 90% of the publications in our field are written like that. We see this a lot in the traditional stages of innovation kind of model of innovation, right? Uh, first you invent something, then you make something, then you sell the thing that you're making. So, you know, I invented the McDonald's hamburger, or at least the process for creating a McDonald's hamburger. I start making hamburgers by the thousands, billions, whatever, and then I start selling them. But I don't think the selling comes after the making. I think if we look at the way things actually work, the selling comes before the making. We focus on the benefit first rather than the idea. 
NASA's technology readiness model. Again, it's that same traditional model of research and development where we have a concept, we prove the concept, we implement the concept, we roll it out in actual production. None of that is how science research and development actually works. It's a lot more like what probably characterizes your work. You're messing around with technology. Something breaks. You look around, you find something, you pull it in and try to make it work. You have a need, something needs to be developed for yesterday. Uh, you'd like to write some you know, testable code, but you don't have time, you have to do it overnight. So you pull together a couple of dozen lines of uh, Python and it works. Uh, you have a learning management system and uh, a student's uh, information system that in theory work together, but in practice need a lot of tweaking on the fly. My work as a researcher is that. Uh, we don't do you know, idea, task, pilot, evaluation, scientific fact. Even in the hard sciences, that's not how it works. It's, we have problems, more or less, and in fact, what defines us as a community is the problem space, what we think is important. We mess around for a while, we talk it out. It's almost like we have a conversation with the phenomenon, and we jury rig a solution, which if it works enough times over times, over time becomes a product. It's like, you know, the movie Apollo 13. That's classic science, right? Dump a bunch of stuff into a room, try to do, uh, you know, try to do uh, carbon uh, dioxide filtration with this stuff. Um, the Martian, same kind of thing. Brilliant movie. I love that movie, right? Let's science this. Science is, let's make something that works. What happens when we mess around with the benefit? Think Apollo 13. Original idea, fly to the moon, land on it, and then go back. New idea, survive. <laughs> right? The benefit changed a lot, right? If you keep the benefit fixed and mess around with ideas and execution, then you get innovation. If you change the benefit, you've changed the terms of the game. And the benefit now defines new ideas, new execution, the benefit comes first, and you get transformation. Advertisers know this really well. Advertisers are in the business of creating demand where demand does not exist. Otherwise, there's no logical explanation for the pet rock or the McRib or, you know. They mess around with our expectations, our needs, our wants. Political process works like that too. I mean, how many of us really want, oh, never mind, I won't go there. <laughs> so, and I'm not sure if I have it in the other slide or not. Benefit is defined as an attractor. We get transformation when we have what can be called a strange attractor. It's not a fixed point. Is something that's moving constantly and in any one of these different kind of patterns of change, right? And this is what's actually happening in education. And this is why innovators haven't been able to get it yet. Innovators are trying to create idea, execution, and benefit, trying to lower the price or, or, or increase the accessibility of an existing product to meet an existing demand. But the world out there is changing. The guy from Google yesterday at the panel, I'm sorry I forgot his name, said a bunch of stuff I actually found objectionable. But one of the things that he said was that there was this sense in which we don't want to follow the model of sending the child to a four-year college. That's not the model of learning anymore. <laughs> and, and as a surprise, that's not the model of learning for most of the people on the planet, 
thing. This isn't just an American thing. This is something that goes beyond borders, beyond the, the typical categories that we think of in the United States. So what is transformation? Some definition. It's not something I've made up, right? There's, you can look this up, read about it. Uh, a process of profound and radical change that orients an organization in a new direction and takes it to an entirely different level of effectiveness. Even that's a little kind of conservative. Um, transformation is a basic change of character of the business. We are going into a basic change of character of the business. What kind of character? Well, here's Microsoft's vision for our field. Look at what they think we want. Learning community, teacher capacity, efficient schools, personalization, physical learning environments. I apologize to the person who asked me about space earlier. Curriculum and assessment. Question number one, is this really transformative? No, this is about as conservative an agenda as you can think of, conservative small c. I'm not talking politics here, right? This is about preserving the existing system. The people in the existing system love this because they're in the existing system. It's working for them. But if we look more broadly, are these things that we really want? Do I wake up in the morning and say, I wish I had a learning community? No, nah, it doesn't come up. <laughs> you know, or, you know, efficient school. My school should be efficient. Well, I don't want to spend so much money on it, but, but again, that's not really the point. I'd spend the money if I was getting the result. Benefits. This is Maslow's hierarchy, kind of, more or less. Right, with physiological needs, food, water, air, etc. at the bottom, safety, security, belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. And I've inserted my core basic need, which is Wi-Fi. <laughs> and you know, we we talk as though this hierarchy of needs, hierarchy of whatever, is constant and not changing, and I think that's a ridiculous proposition. Self-actualization as the top? I just came from Thailand at the top, they're talking about social order, social harmony as being the value that they want to pursue in their society. Uh, other cultures belonging is the highest value. Self-actualization is actually destructive. And I was thinking this morning, because uh, I got up kind of early and I was watching the news. Self-actualization, one of your presidential candidates is self-actualization defined. <laughs> is that really the highest goal? We can at least ask the question. We can ask whether Maslow actually speaks for us. And again, this is a set of attractors. I argue these are strange attractors. They are changing. They're changing constantly and really we should be looking at the attractors rather than looking at the traditional system and trying to define it by means of quote unquote innovation. Look at how education has in fact transformed in the past, defined not from the perspective of technology, but defined from the perspective of benefit. Again, off the cuff, I made this up but it'll do as a talking point. We can think of four major, you know, count the fingers, four major things in education. Past needs, right? I went out hunting yesterday, I caught a boar, and this is how he did it. Storytelling. Uh, present needs. Um, I'm working in a mill, you are my child, you will work because I need more mill production. Here's how you do your work now. That was education for centuries, right? Future needs, when we got industrialization, now you're preparing for a need that doesn't exist exist yet, but will need, right? Uh, you have to work on the factory. You have to be on time. You have to be able to follow instructions, read the instructions, do what you're told, and produce quality product. And now, the more late 20th century model, post, uh, you know, post World War II, GI Bill, et cetera model, potential needs, the root to academia. Why are we teaching children 
algebra and trigonometry in high school because they might need it in the future when they go to university. You know, though all of those, those are our dimensions of change, right? Past, future, probability, possibility, etc. Same kind of thing. It all hangs together. It may not seem like it, but conceptually it does. What are the benefits of the future? What are the models, the innovations, the approaches that we're looking for for the future, right? Don't look to the technology. When I wrote the future of online learning, yeah, I talked about the technology, but what drove my writing was an understanding of the changing definition of needs that people would have. And in 1998, I realized that people would be as interested in things like sending pictures of their cats and their food to other people I didn't write that specifically, I wasn't that precise, but I knew that our use of technology would be as illogical uh, as anything the technology actually produced for us. When I build technology, I try to create affordances, not outcomes, in order to allow for this changing definition of benefit. Why did I do that? I used to work with Texas Instruments on multi-million, probably hundreds of million dollar computer systems with disk drives literally the size of that table and connecting to what we call the remote job entry network, Australia, Scotland, Texas, Calgary, etc. It's a geophysical services environment. And I used this, it's pre-internet, pre-whatever. I used this to play chess with a person and the routing our instructions through Australia because I could. They kicked me off the system for it, but you know, there's a lesson in that. Benefits, idea, execution. So let's reframe some of these issues. I'm going to skip through some of these fairly quickly, but, but I want you to be thinking now, instead of thinking traditional domain of education, think of these from the perspective of changing our idea of what constitutes the benefit, which means we have to get out of our particular context and put ourselves into the shoes of not even our existing students because they're the ones who are succeeding in the current system, they're gonna be very conservative about it, but people outside the system, potential students, students who would have been students but couldn't afford it, students who are working now and you know can't get away from the job, whatever. So here are some of the issues, right? Students have to pay too much. That's a big issue. Assessment, honestly, is a joke. I, I, it's a whole other talk. Uh, texts and resources, et cetera, are locked behind paywalls. I try to do research for this kind of thing. You know, I hit a, a paywall instead of a resource. That's not helping me a bit. Uh, and I hate to say that at a publishing company conference. But there you go. Uh, content is poorly communicated. I could go on and on, but the point was made, was it yesterday? Well, it was yesterday, but who was it? Uh, the Khan Academy lecture got the point in 10 minutes. The IT lecture spent 50 minutes to make the same point poorly. There you go. Um, student life is really stressed. I mean, I got my gray hair while I was a student, not while I was a researcher. It wasn't just genetics. I could go on about the research or what's called research and education at length is very poorly defined. It's these intervention outcome things as though the outcome that they're measuring is the actual benefit we're trying to produce in education. New models of deployment, again, the idea that we would do one thing and then do another thing and then do another thing, uh, as David Wiley says, iterating toward openness, I think is mistaken. I think that to get at actual change in education, we have to deploy what uh, uh, Larry Downs and Paul Newman, or Paul Newman's call, Paul Newman, <laughs> uh, Big Bang was hitting a bunch of things at once, the innovation, the market, and the experimentation, doing it all at once, messing around the technology. There's a new institutional perspective coming uh, and it's based on not providing an education, 
It's based on helping people do the things that they want to do. Imagine if our university system was structured around that need. I mean, that by itself would create transportation. Actually helping people accomplish the things that they're trying to do. Um, knowledge sharing is your job, says Alfie Cohen. Of course it is. But then professors take their papers and lock them behind paywalls. Uh, providing Daniel Pink, providing opportunities for autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Three things that are exactly the opposite of traditional college and university education. New, yeah, new learning paradigms. Uh, I did a talk a while ago, not too long ago, about the shift in metaphor of learning from path to field. This is again when somebody asked me, was I interested in spaces? This is where my mind first went. Right? Our model of education is a course, a sequence, movement through a subject area, uh, you know, thresholds, leveling up, getting grades, uh, being led, etc. That metaphor in no way, again, defines the benefit that people are looking for. For the most part, people aren't looking to be led through four years of continuous instruction. That's how we do it for 20% of the population, less if we can consider it globally. That's not typically what they want. Somebody's in an airplane, it's crashing, telling them take a four week course is not going to address the need. We need to be thinking of field, a curriculum as in mapping, as in understanding a large area, not as a body of content, but as a thing that we immerse ourselves in, run around in frolicking in the field. That's more a better model of learning, where there's a core, a periphery, maybe a foundation, maybe you're not, where there's grouping and clustering in this field, where there's a community of inquiry that's more or less cohesive, whether there is a domain of knowledge not necessarily based on a set of core facts or core principles, but different principles that apply at different times. Again, that's, that's a whole one hour talk. The connectivist MOOC is based on this. The connectivist MOOC, which we made, George Siemens and myself, is designed as a network, not as a progression through a curriculum. We didn't actually have a quote unquote curriculum. We had content. We called content the MacGuffin. And the idea was that it would be the strange attractor that we could use to lead people through the course. They would follow the content because it interested them so long as it served their needs. But there wasn't that any expectation that they would master that content or remember that content. They could if they wanted, but that was not the objective of most of the people in the course. We assume that everybody who comes into our courses is after the same thing. And that's a ridiculous assumption, particularly when you have open courses that invite everyone, as opposed to courses that you paid $14,000 for or whatever, um, and you come from a relatively affluent background and really what you're mostly majoring is in graduating from Yale or whatever. Personalized, I think, is the traditional conservative way of modern edu modernizing education because, again, it's all based on getting people to this educational objective or outcome. Personal learning, and again, this is a whole talk, right? Personal learning is based around what a person needs, what a person wants, the benefit as defined by them at that time, and providing affordances, helping them out, providing support, making it possible for them to achieve their objectives. Learning outcomes. I talked about the idea of assessment being messed up. We don't actually understand assessment. We think that we are assessing learning if we ask people whether they recall specific facts or can perform a specific task or demonstrate a specific skill. But we know that in both the personal sense and in the social sense, knowledge of a discipline is not the acquisition 
of something. It is the growth or transformation of the person into something. As I say in this slide here, we are using social networks like our MOOC in order to create neural networks, to create an actual state of being a psychologist or being a physicist or being whatever it is that that person wants to be. The question of how we assess a state of being something isn't asking them questions, it's a question of recognition. You take people in the social networks and you ask them, is that person one of those? And if especially experts in that social network say, yes, that person is one of those, we've achieved the recognition task. An example of this, the doctor who practices as an intern will not be allowed to practice, not if they pass the test. Yeah, sure, they got to pass tests or whatever, but if a senior doctor looks at them, looks at what they do and says, yes, this person is a qualified physician. And the proof of that is the intern could pass all of the tests, but if the supervising doctor said, this person is simply not professional, they don't get to be a doctor. You have to pass the recognition test. That's why we have oral exams. There's a new model of work and learning based on sharing, contributing, co-creating. All of these are alien. Okay, I shouldn't say alien. That's too strong. Not part of the core mission of the existing academic institution, but they will be. And they will be part of the core mission beyond the academic institution. All right, my thing's flashing at me. Uh, how do we do this? How do we look at the past, the future, and all of that uh, as though it's signs, as though it's a strange attractor, all of the rest? Um, very quickly, I'll outline some of what I call critical literacies. As I said at the beginning, we look at the picture of the fish on the wall or whatever, and it's like we're reading it. It's not like we're going through some kind of rigorous process. I'm, it's like we're reading it in the sense that it's a quick, intuitive, almost automatic thing. You look at an environment and you just see. Here are the stages of getting to that state, the strategies. First, fairly obviously, find the patterns, find the forms, rules, operations, the idea is that if these are out there, you see them. If you see the patterns of change, you can recognize them. If you see patterns of similarity and phenomena, commonalities among students, etc. But there's none of these that are privileged over the other. Uh, they talk about, you know, the objective of science is to find universal laws of nature. To a large degree, science has given up on that. Um, to a large degree, we don't think there are universal laws of nature. But there are forms, patterns, operations, regularities, etc., that are really useful, and being able to spot them is a useful trait. Looking for meaning. Um, you know, this is you know, maybe where the science of education has kind of gotten to at this point. Um, looking for truth, meaning, purpose, goal, actually studying your field. You know, when I look at the picture of the fish, I'm looking at, I'm asking, why is it there? And it's not just a philosophical question, it's me interrogating the phenomenon, having a conversation with the phenomenon. Observe the practice. What are people actually doing? The, the, the slogan form of this is uh, paving the cow paths, right? Looking, you know, Wittgenstein says, you know, meaning is based on use. What people value is shown by what they actually do. What they believe is shown by act what they actually do. Making projections. Yeah, this is classic science, drawing explanations, making predictions. It's just a small part of it. But what this means is as you're conversing with your phenomena, as you're looking, say, at your educational environment, thinking in terms of what will happen next? What, what do I think will happen? What is the reason for this happening? What do they mean by such and such a term? A term? I, I spend a lot of time reading academic papers asking myself, this word that they're using, what does it mean? I do not think it means what you think it means. 
and you should recognize the pattern and the cultural reference, right? And you, you do that just automatically. Consider the context. Whoops, come on, click. Consider the context. What else could have happened? What were the other expectations? What were the alternatives? Yeah, we do these tests for learning outcomes. What if we weren't testing for learning outcomes? What else would we be testing for? What possible other objective for education could there be? Uh, you know, what is the meaning of a term? As Dorita says, look, depends on what the other terms mean. Um, what are the vocabularies that are being used? What is our existing sense of the logical possibilities? What could happen? Is that an accurate sense? George Lakoff has a whole dialogue about frames and worldviews and being aware of what worldview you're in, what frame you're using, is significant and important to understanding what you think people want and what you think is going to happen. Change, finally, managing change, as though we could manage something that is really a steady state. Uh, but, you know, uh, understanding relations between things, connections between things, understanding flow historicities insofar as it exists, uh, understanding with McClune, uh, you know, when something new happens, what has become obsolete, what old thing has been retrieved, etc. Understanding progression, even in learning, I put a few things about games in there because games are really all about different ways of progressing. Uh, and even dull, boring, mundane things like scheduling, which is probably a large part of all of your existence. Knowledge, recognition are the same thing. Understanding the future is a phenomenon of recognition. Understanding the future is the same, epistemologically, mentally, exactly the same as reading a paragraph or of identifying your grandmother in a crowded room. The same thing is happening. And being able to see this and seeing beyond the fairly limited conception that we have of change and innovation in our domain and the fairly limited understanding we have of the aspirations and objectives, goals, and values of our students will be fundamentally important to understanding what is going to happen in the future, what will count as transformative change in our institution, what we really need to prepare for, and what we can ignore as irrelevant. That's me. I'm a little late, but thank you very much for your time and your kind attention. Thank you so much. Uh, I you can't get any better than that. Um, please join us downstairs in the actual hall. Thanks. Thanks, Steve.